Now, facilitated communication is really interesting, but it's quite difficult to get your head around. And I think one of the tools that we can use is one that we saw last week. We can look at a two by two contingency table. So again, there are two ways of being right and two ways of being wrong in this case. You can say that the communication is coming from the client, or you can say that the communication is coming from the facilitator. In reality, what actually is the case, the communication can actually be coming from the client or it can actually be coming from the facilitator. Now, let's take the first case, a hit. You can say that the communication is coming from the client when it actually is. That's a hit. Or there's a miss. You can say that the communication is coming from the facilitator when it's actually coming from the client. That's right, but I think it's worth pausing there for a second and, and unpacking what we mean by a miss here. Okay, so this is what we alluded to before um, Scott's conversation where we were talking about uh, what it would be like to be uh, a parent of an autistic kid who can in fact communicate, but we're not essentially giving them the benefit of the doubt. We're saying that the facilitator is communicating, not the autistic inv individual, even though they have the capability of doing it. Right? They have the ability to communicate. They have this rich inner life and they're trapped inside. And this technique is useful, um, but it's the facilitator who's essentially putting the words in the, in the mouth of the autistic uh, individual. Now that's a miss, that's really tragic. If, if there's a case, so we're gonna link to this in the learn more section. And it's the, it was a frontline documentary that aired uh, in 1993, I think it was, but it's outstanding. It's called The Prisoners of Silence. And throughout this interview, throughout this documentary, uh, they interview a bunch of uh, the parents, the uh, show this technique, uh, the facilitators, and it really puts some flesh on the bones of this topic that we're talking about. And there's one, it still gets me just thinking about it. It's um, one of the parents of the autistic kids is talking about what it was like for the first time to have uh, her daughter say, uh, I love you, mom. Right? And you could just, your heart just fills. I mean, it, it's, it's incredible just to imagine being a parent of this, of this child who, who has never been able to say I love you. And, and just going through years and years of, of having a silent child and then, and then recognizing, well, in fact, they can communicate, right? The potential cost of a miss is huge. Right? If these people can communicate, and we're not giving them the, the, the benefit of the doubt, we're not giving them the opportunity, then you know, that's, that's major. I mean, that, that's, that's massive. And we need to consider that. I mean, yes, it, it sounds, it's, you can have this sort of um, cheap cynicism, in a sense, that hindsight is operating in 2020 here, and say, you know, and, and get outraged. Yes, they can't communicate. How could you have been so stupid? stupid? Yeah. Right? But that's not enough. I mean, what if they could communicate? Right? Think of that. What if <laughs> it, I, I think the cost of a miss is really worth considering. Yep. yep. So that's a miss. Let's, let's have a look at the other side. So another way that you can be correct is a correct rejection. You can say that the communication is coming from the facilitator when it actually is coming from the facilitator. It's kind of, it's kind of a non-event. So uh, there was a claim out there. We did some experiments and we found, no, there wasn't much to be had. But the other flip side is a false alarm. So this is the case where you say that the communication is coming from the client when it's actually coming from the facilitator. Yeah. Now, the costs there are, are pretty huge, I think. It'd be tempting to say, you know, what's the harm in this case if, uh, if we do make that kind of mistake? But I, I don't think that's good enough. The costs are going to be huge for a false alarm. That's right. We, this is, Scott alluded to those costs as well mm. uh, during the conversation, right? Of, of going down this path of treating clients for using this technique when in fact there's nothing there to be had, right? So the cost of, of shifting an entire line of research to facilitate a communication where it was completely ineffective, um, putting money into the research, putting, um, you know, changing, getting the hopes of parents up in a sense and saying, well, in fact, no, in fact, your child isn't communicating at all. It was the facilitator all along. Imagine that. I mean, that would be just as devastating. 
But what gets me about this, what really irritates me about this entire process is the fact that this didn't need to happen. You, it didn't need to get to this point where you are giving these parents hope and then pulling the rug from underneath them. It didn't have to be that way. And the way that we could have resolved this entire thing before it started was to have a correct right. rejection, right? Was to say that, was to do a lot of these, we, we, taught about, we taught students in this course about blind experiments, right? About the power of double blinding and everything else. We did an entire episode on wine tasting and uh, using this double blind technique. It was kind of cheap. That's something you could do on a weekend, but just as easily That's right. you could do it with something as big as facilitated communication. I don't think it would have been outside the realm of uh, consideration for anyone who's taking this course to be able to design an experiment to determine whether it was the facilitator who was communicating or whether it was the client. Designing this sort of team maze, is, this was not hard. You could do this with in an afternoon and $100, right, to design this, uh, the, the mechanism to do that. But it wasn't done, right? Research is cheap. Clinical programs are really expensive, right? So when this was brought over to Syracuse University, where they completely blew this out into training and hiring facilitators and, and doing this entire process, that's really expensive. But you could find out whether there was anything to it in an afternoon and a couple two by fours, yep. right? I think that's not okay. Yep. So still on the costs of a false alarm, there's a great website called What's the Harm? And this details um, a, a lot of alternative therapies and uh, health techniques and, and healing. It, it just has the false alarm cells. So it gives examples of people who have chosen homeopathic remedies over traditional ones and they've died. And in our case, in, facil in, in the case of facilitated communication, there were, there were accusations that uh, autistic children were were being abused. So the children were typing out, oh, my, my daddy has touched me and things like that. And the, the state took the children away and there were yeah. huge court cases. The, the harm there is huge. So I, I encourage people to go to the website to, to push against that idea of what's the harm when, when we deal with these things. Let's just, you know, let people have these beliefs and, and go along our merry way. It's really tempting to say, what's the harm? Right, and, and people do this all the time. Um, it's, it's almost, it almost has this sort of liberal cachet to it and saying, what's the harm? Just let people do what they do and you know, it'll be fine. Yeah. And well, to argue against that, to be very exactly. seemingly very cynical. Yep. And it, yeah, arguing the other side of that. So it's, it's a response bias in a sense, a response bias to say that the thing is working regardless of whether it is or not, whether that thing be uh, psychic phenomena or homeopathy or, uh, or chiropractic treatment. What's the harm? I'll give it a go and, and actually see. Well, that website exactly shows you what the harm is. It shows you that people are now paralyzed from using this particular uh, alternative treatment. Or again, in, in allegations of sexual abuse when in fact it was the facilitator who was communicating. Uh, and on and on and on. I mean, pick your case and you can see what the harms actually are. And it's exactly the same problem that we faced before. Consider all four cells. That's what we want people to do. Just consider both costs. I mean, hopefully we've done a bit of justice here in considering uh, the cost of a miss relative to the cost of a false alarm. Neither are acceptable. Don't get me wrong. And we could have avoided both, right, by doing a little bit of research in the beginning. Yep. So the... the in the case of facilitated communication, do you do? It's quite clear in the case of facilitated communication that the the communications were coming from the facilitators and not the clients. Mm -hmm. So, what does that mean for the facilitators? Did they were they aware that they were influencing these communications? Yeah, I really don't think so. And again, going back to the cases of sexual abuse, uh, to the allegations of sexual abuse, I can't imagine anybody in their right mind that would. Uh, do that, right? That would actually say um, your child is being abused when in fact they weren't. I, I think what's, well, we know <laughs> what's actually happening in this case is something called an experimenter expectancy effect. That is, um, well, let's, let's let Scott tell the story of exactly what was happening in the case of facilitated communication. Mm -hmm.